All right, for those who just joined the, the webinar on this year's hurricane season, we're going to get started in just about one minute as that attendee number keeps climbing and climbing and climbing. All right. Well, thank you for everyone for joining today's webinar. I'm Joseph Sakawi, the Chief Waterfront Design Officer at Waterfront Alliance. Waterfront Alliance is a U.S.-based nonprofit with a growing alliance of more than 1,100 partners. We focus on environmental and economic development, uh, bringing about real change to shorelines, waterfronts, and coastlines across the nation and in our home in the New York and New Jersey region. So for Climate Week, Waterfront Alliance has centered critical climate resilience issues facing New York City through a series of webinars, roundtable discussions, art exhibits and panels, and coastal cleanups. We applaud the folks who are on the call today doing a Friday afternoon webinar at the end of Climate Week. Uh, if you're like the, the rest of us, you've been to dozens of events this week. Um, we're so thrilled that you're, you're here. Um, and this is, you know, this is the last of Waterfront Alliance's um, Climate Week events, but certainly uh, just a continuation of the work that we do over the long haul. So today's webinar is titled This Year's Hurricane Season, What Does It Mean and Why? Um, the forecast for 2024 includes the highest number of hurricanes ever predicted. And this presentation and, and, and discussion is going to cover how these predictions are made, the weather patterns involved with hurricanes, and what we can expect for our region this year. It's my honor to introduce a really stellar set of, of panelists today. So we have um, Victoria Salinas, who's an appointee in the Biden-Harris administration, currently leads the Resilience Department um, at FEMA. Uh, FEMA Resilience helps communities across the U.S. adapt, survive, recover, and thrive in the face of natural disasters and security threats. There are a variety of programs that aim to help communities better understand their risk transfer risk through uh, insurance and build capacity to prepare, protect, respond, and recover from disasters. We also have Christina Farrell, who serves as the first deputy commissioner of the New York City Emergency Management Department. Christina has been with the city of New York since 1994, with NISM um, since 2003. We have Matt Rosencrantz, who's the director of the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, or NOAA's climate test bed in the lead for the seasonal hurricane outlook at NOAA's Climate Prediction Center, or CPC, which is a division of the National Weather Service. Um, he's previously their, their lead forecaster uh, and was also a, a United States Air Force weather officer. And then finally, we have Dr. Klaus Jacobs, geophysicist at Columbia University's Lamont Doherty Earth Observatory. He's been there for more than, than five decades and his expertise spans earthquakes, disasters, climate, I mean, he has a focus on disaster risk management with most of his current research on rising sea levels, climate change, and disaster resilient megacities. Uh, and he's in, within the region, worked on the New York City panel for, for climate change, rebuilt, worked with Rebuild by Design, um, and with the MTA on their climate change adaptation modeling. Thank you guys all for being here. Thank you to the, the attendees for being here. You know, we had a, a planning call about this panel, about two weeks ago, and at that point, we had a much quieter Atlantic than, than we do today. And late last night, as I'm sure everybody knows, Hurricane Helene made landfall as a Category 4 storm in Florida's Big Bend region. And the, there, the, the storm and the, the emergency response are still ongoing. Uh, we know there's loss of life. We know there's catastrophic damage. You know, we're, we're saddened by this development and, and the people of Florida and Georgia and the Carolinas are, are all in our thoughts today. Um, I think this is a somber reminder of the importance of today's topic. We won't, you know, we won't be talking specifically about Helene today, but you know, at the rather at the broader fo forces that are at play um, and our response to them. Um, though if, you know, Victoria or Matthew or other panelists um, want to speak to uh, want to speak to the uh, events with Helene. 
you know, in, in that your opening question, you know, please feel feel free to do so, given that it's such a, a, a present and, and ongoing event. So to open up our, our discussion you know, to, and, and really set the stage, we are seeing records broken, uh, not only for the number of hurricanes, but also timing and intensity of hurricanes as well. So Matthew, I wanna start with you. Can you help us understand just the current hurricane season, what's happening so far, and what's predicted to happen for the rest of the year? Sure, <clears throat> yeah, so, um... We've had 10 named storms uh, this year, which a named storm is either a subtropical storm or a tropical storm uh, where the winds reach 39 miles per hour or greater. Um, and so we, you know, National Hurricane Center will give it a name. Um, 10 of those named storms, six of the, or excuse me, out of those 10 named storms, six have become hurricanes. Um, so 60% have trans kind of made that transition and gone to that next phase. Um, that's quite, that's a bit higher than normal. Normal's about 45 to 50%. Um, so is there a signal there? Um, so that's one of the things we look into, um, the, kind of the fraction of storms that make hurricane from named storms. Um, and then we've had two major hurricanes this year as well with Beryl and um, Helene. Uh, so that's, you know, those are category three, four, and five storms, major hurricanes, winds 111 miles per hour. Um, that's about a third of the hurricanes making major hurricane. That's about on par with uh, with normal. Um, we have had four landfalls in the U.S. this year so far and along the Gulf Coast. Um, that's not record. Record would be six, but four is at the higher end of that. Um, and we're only at the end of September, um, not, not even yet. Um, so we still have some time to come. Um, the outlook did have 17 to 25 named storms for NOAA um, in our May outlook and 17 to 24 in the updated outlook. So we have potentially seven plus more named storms to go, um, at least a couple more hurricanes because we had eight to 11 hurricanes forecast, or eight to 13, excuse me. Um, and then we had, we've had six hurricanes already. So we have at least two more hurricanes to go and to fit into the outlook. Um, so kind of and what goes into that outlook, um, right? We take into account sea surface temperatures, we're taking, you know, observed and predicted um, Atlantic and Pacific for the sea surface temperatures. For, um, the sea surface temperatures in the Pacific really play into the uh, La Nina forecast, and that's really taken into account into our outlook. Um, between the sea surface temperatures in the Atlantic and the La Nina or El Nino status in the Pacific, you can explain about 80% of your changes year to year in hurricane activity, but there's that 20% that's still in the uh, uncertainties in the science. Um, that's kind of one of the things we saw this year was a very active West African monsoon that may have contributed to that lull in activity in the early part of September when we planned this and had that quiet period where we were talking about it. Um, so that's something that we're going to look into this year and see how many other years have had that. Um, it's not many. This is the first time in some in about 40 years that some of those places in Africa got rain this year that haven't had rain. Um, I'm sure that we'll ask questions in the research community. Um, is that kind of the new normal? Are we shifting towards that um, in this kind of warmer world? Um, are we, or is that just kind of <clears throat> variations about it? And that's kind of in um, the things we're gonna see in the future. We just need to incorporate that kind of very range of possibilities in our outlook. Um, we've also seen some tremendous warming in the upper levels, um, 35 to 45,000 feet um, in the air over top of the Atlantic. And that can have a kind of capping effect on storms in the Atlantic. Uh, and that's another potential um, contributor to that kind of quiet period uh, where with the kind of peak of the hurricane season, normally September 10th, normally you ramp, ramp up in the first couple of weeks, of, uh, last couple of weeks of August, we kind of did see a lull there. So that may be another explainer. Um, and teams at NOAA will do our own internal attribution studies, but we also engage with research community um, partners in academia and partners within other federal labs and international researchers and international laboratories as well too. So we can really pinpoint kind of what caused that. Um, so, but there's still a lot of work to do um, to understand the real nuances um, as, you know, of the hurricane seasonal hurricane outlooks. Um, we're doing work to see, can we do a, can we even forecast kind of lulls like this? Can we forecast, you know, early seasons and late seasons? Uh, something we're really looking into with the uh, internal NOAA labs and there are academic partners as well.
Do others want to want to share anything about kind of this this current hurricane season? Otherwise, I'm I'm happy to jump to to Klaus with a, a next question. I would add um, one thing on this. Um, I think what we're seeing too in terms of this hurricane season, or even right now with with Hurricane Helene, is that um, these the predictions are always very helpful. And, is, and as is the modeling, but what we're really seeing too is just as storms are getting more frequent and more intense, they're moving in different ways. They're moving further inland. As, as you mentioned, Joseph, um, the, the flood warnings are going to states that are miles away from coastal Florida. And so the emergency declarations and the emergency preparedness measures, the high winds, uh, flash floods, landslides, have a tremendous impact region. And so I think in terms of like, as we as FEMA think about preparing for this storm, other storms, uh, the, what's coming, it's no longer so long people, for, for a long time, people kind of looked at the cone of, of the, tra the trajectory of a storm and were like focused on the cone. But the secondary and tertiary impacts of these storms are something that when we think about preparing for this season, other seasons, it's not just about the water. It's also about the, like we saw with Burl, there was, there was a storm and then there was heat and then there was no power. And so the interrelatedness of all of these uh, cascading consequences is, is, is now part of the new normal in terms of how we think about preparing for a storm season it's everything from the storm to the tornado to the power outage to the extreme heat that are part of a storm season. And so, Klaus, that you know, both Matthew and Victoria brought in a couple, um, a couple pieces, and and I'd love to have you give kind of an overview here. So we heard from Matthew some of the the some of the different factors that are influencing the development of hurricanes, and and we heard from Victoria that. Just the intensity and 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 frequency are are changing, and the timing is changing. So, can you describe kind of for us the specific weather patterns that contribute to the formation of hurricanes, and mm -hmm. then what role is climate change playing in changing the intensity of hurricanes? Uh, I would prefer to almost skip over the first part of your question to me, because I'm not a meteorologist. Uh, I'm more into climate change adaptation. But I listen to my colleagues at Lamont who understand these things. And so when I sort of can summarize what the influence of climate change is, then for coastal area, there are two things to consider now and into the future. We have for 100 years put greenhouse gases into the atmosphere, and we are still putting gigatons per year of CO2 carbon dioxide into the atmosphere from our fossil energy use. We are far from any targets that in Paris was that in 2015 were agreed upon. And so we are not on a curve in decreasing our greenhouse gas emissions as fast as we had hoped if we want to stabilize the temperature of the atmosphere around 1.5 degree before a certain datum in the past, uh, above a certain datum in the past. So we are still producing more climate change. Now climate change, uh, particularly in coastal areas has two consequences. First of all, the overall ocean warms up with more warmer ocean, there's more water that goes into the atmosphere, but if the atmosphere is warmer, it can hold more moisture. So those two things are the food that nourish hurricanes or tropical storms in general. Climate uh, models, uh, as I understand it, don't really forecast 
a higher number of storms developing. But what they do seem to forecast is their intensity is increasing. And therefore, if we only count the important storms, yes, their number is increasing. The smaller storms or the overall number of storms may not increase. And uh, what we heard before from Matthew, it sounds like we are on this upper trend for severe storms over time recently. The other effect that is only gradually emerging now, but will become ever more important in the future is, as the ocean warms, it expands just in thermal expansion. In addition, climate change also melts the land-based ice in Greenland and Antarctica. That molten ice ends up in the ocean, also increases. So sea level is rising. Now, if you have storm surges from hurricanes combining with ever higher sea level, then you need ever smaller storms to reach the same point on the coast, which means the flooding events, even so the number of storms in each category will not much increase, or even if only the strong ones increase, the flooding frequency will increase. And we see that already, we have already a sunny day, uh, inundation during high tides in many coastal areas because of increased sea level rise. And as the sea level rise goes in accelerated, not just in a linear fashion, but ex accelerating uh, into the future, this coastal flooding will become ever more frequent and more severe. In fact, I did some calculations what it means for the New York City area. Uh, by the end of the century, if you take a certain sea level rise forecast in the past uh, storm surge heights, uh, a sandy type of uh, event like we had here in 2012, and its flooding level that will be reached, let's say a certain subway entrance, that same subway entrance will be reached by a 10-year storm instead of a multi-hundred-year storm uh, in recurrence period. That is a amplification of the hazard, flooding hazard, by a factor of in the order of 50. Make it anywhere from between 10 and 100, but somewhere in that order of magnitude. So a radical increase in the flooding fre uh, frequency in the coastal areas. And that, I think, is the most devastating effect as far as I can see in the coastal areas from climate change, because we cannot defend all coasts of the United States or for many other countries around the world, which means we will have to eventually retreat from the coast. Good luck for politicians to pull that off. That's then a good segue to to Victoria and Matthew, with, with this radical increase in the intensity of hurricanes and the damage that they bring, can you talk us through what the federal government's doing to, to prepare for those responses? And even you know over the, the, the last few years, what have the challenges been so far? Let's start with Victoria and then go to Matthew. And then I'll have a very similar question for Christina on the local side. Great, so I think uh, as, as Klaus was also saying, it really lifts up the importance of adaptation and risk reduction. And so for us, um, we don't see just a hurricane season anymore. It's a year round disaster cycle. Uh, last year alone, we had um, on average every, we had one disaster every three days that had some type of emergency or federal declaration. And that's, uh, that's just indicative of the new pace of things. And so for us and then across the federal government, I think the, the big shift has been to uh, really embed resilience and adaptation in all of our different programs, whether it's through the bipartisan infrastructure law or the Inflation Reduction Act. 
um, my a shift in and really thinking about how any program can create multiple benefits for a community. Any piece of infrastructure can be multifunctional. That different types of hazards are addressed and reduced through any action that we might take. And so that's really um, having those co-benefits and are, are and are a key part of our approach to investing in in communities whether that be through nature-based solutions, which can help with the CO2 emissions and, redu and, 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 and traditional climate mitigation to helping with flood, flood management. And so that's just kind of big picture of the, the approach side, but if, at FEMA, there's a couple things that I wanted to highlight in particular. When it comes to being able to tackle these challenges in front of us, there's um, certainly how we're utilizing our grants and through the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, the bipartisan infrastructure law, we certainly saw this administration deploy a lot of resources at FEMA, our Building Resilient Infrastructure and Communities Program. It's been focused on transformational types of projects. We started a new revolving loan fund for smaller projects to make it easier to help communities take those smaller adaptation measures that oftentimes have an outsized impact. Our flood mitigation assistance program again got bill funding. It was part of just as part of Justice 40. Even this week, we did we announced 70 million in, in new projects, 50, over 50 percent of which are going to underserved communities. So there's a theme here about how we leverage our our programs, but it's also more than that. It's how we work together. And last month, we released the national resilience guidance, which was um, developed based on input from many people across the nation, different agencies, different sectors. And it gets at how we work together to help communities achieve and increase their resilience. It, lines, it outlines the responsibilities from households all the way to different sectors. And I lift that up because it's the unity of effort that we see in response and recovery that we have to pull forward to the prevention space, the risk reduction space for us to tackle the adaptation, the risk reduction that we need to have happen imminently in order to make sure that our communities are survivable for what is coming. Yeah, and then for within NOAA and the Weather Service, we're really trying to focus on getting kind of actionable information to each one of these communities. Um, you know, talk, going out into the communities, we have offices across the country that are really engaged on a day-to-day -day basis, taking that feedback and saying, what, what data and what formats can we give you the information in so you can make those make those decisions not only tomorrow's decision um, like with you know the hurricane center and the, the changes we make to the graphics there so we can get that information to people so they can get out of harm's way when asked to um, but also downscaling climate information and getting them the information the scales they can use so they can plan for you know not this year's hurt tomorrow's hurricane this year's hurricanes coming and you know five ten years worth of, of even 20 years worth of hurricanes coming in the future um what can they do with those grants and things um in the most targeted manner right so noah's going to provide a lot of the science to help make those decisions um and inform those decisions uh and, and so that way it's they're kind of done more efficiently and done really where the local communities can kind of use them to their best advantage. Um, I don't want to try and tell someone exactly what they need to do in their area, but I'd like to give them all the information they need to make those decisions in their, in their local area. Um, and then, you know, the other arms of NOAA, right? We're always looking at new technologies to look at coastal recovery, um, after storm, post storm recovery, land surveys after that. Um, there's lots of offices within, you know, I'm sure they'll be out there right on the coast of Florida now to remap the coastline of Florida. Um, so, and we're constantly increasing our capacity in those ways, increasing our capacity to even monitor these storms in the future <clears throat> to really detect those trends um, in those major hurricanes or, you know, are we getting more of those major hurricanes? Um, so we're really trying to grab at all the science and technology that's out there through unmanned vehicles or whatever we need to do to get that information both from the you know global scale science and then bring it to local communities as well. Yeah, I, I, I really like that that concept of, of downscaling the this in climate information so that it's it's accessible and useful for local communities. And and Christina, I I, I want to hear from you around you know how New York City is preparing for 
potential impacts of this hurricane season. And I also want to keep, I, I want to ask you to keep pulling on that thread of public awareness and, and public preparedness um, here in New York City. Yeah, for sure. Um, so a few things that we have done over the years, and um, you know, as you mentioned, I've been with emergency management for uh, 21 years now. And um, you know, I have to say that the awareness, the tools that uh, FEMA, NOAA, and our other federal and, and state partners have provided, um, and then just real world experience has really changed the conversation here as it has uh, in many places. Um, you know, people, we always knew the risks of hurricanes here. We talked a lot about it, um, but it really took um, Sandy, you know, for people to take it seriously. And even then people were like, well, okay, that was a fluke. Uh, we're going back around our business. Um, you know, I think that conversation has has changed, um, but there is, you know, much work that remains to be done. Um, on our side, uh, you know, we are, um, New York City is a big city, we, obviously. We are, um, you know, we have a very large emergency management agency here, uh, not big enough in our eyes, but we have, uh, you know, more resources uh, than than many of our, our big city partners. Um, and so, you know, a few things we've done that have helped and that we're working on. Um, we hired an in-house meteorologist, a full-time meteorologist who, you know, works very closely with the weather service, is able um, to keep up with the demand um, that we have for uh, ongoing situational awareness and, and analysis of threats as the threats evolve. Um, so that's been invaluable. And I have to say, he's been so patient uh, with me and others to sit and just explain, um, you know, all the different things, because it's not always intuitive. And also, as things change, uh, you know, it, it's difficult to um, to log those changes. Um, you know, just like everywhere else, obviously, events here are becoming more frequent and disruptive. Um, you know, speaking about post-tropical cyclone Ida, which was just over three years ago here, um, that set a sec uh, single hour rainfall rate record of 3.15 inches per hour in Central Park, which is our official, um, you know, register. Uh, the interesting thing is that a week and a half before we had had a uh, tropical storm on Re, which had set a record, you know, nine, 10 days before. So it, um, you know, it, and then, but we had tropical storm Elsa in, in July that, I, you know, had been at a record or close. So it's the storms are coming and, and we are, learning from that. The other thing that we really learned from Ida, um, you know, like others had mentioned, we really focused on the coast. We saw what happened in Staten Island and in Jamaica Bay and Rockaway and Coney Island. Um, and, you know, that storm um, led to flooded streets, subways, basement apartments, tragically 13 New Yorkers lost their lives. And that really changed the conversation for us. Um, it increased our understanding of inland flood risk and, you know, that's something over the last three years, in addition to all the other things we're planning for that we really have been looking at. Um, you know, one of our, our projects that we put in place, because the, there was a lot of resiliency money that came out after uh, Hurricane Sandy, um, but, you know, it's incredibly complicated to build and to put things in place in the city. Uh, so in 2016, we established the Interim Flood Protection Measures Program, um, which we worked with a lot of um, a lot of it goes for agencies, for the police department, fire department, environmental protection to protect the infrastructure that we saw so badly damaged during Sandy. Um, and so we were able to install 50 of these sites throughout the city while the permanent mitigation work is coming. Um, some of them are are, you know, there. you can see them on a sunny day all the time. Other ones um, are put in place uh, closer to a storm. We did activate. Um, in August 2020, we had Tropical Storm SEAS, and we did um, activate down at the South Street Seaport and have a real life example there. Um, but that's that's something that really has improved our understanding of risk-based decision making, um, so we can right size our response. You know, some of what we saw in the city was uh, we had um, Hurricane Irene in 2011. It didn't hit here the way it hit in Vermont and and some places upstate. And so the next year, when Hurricane Sandy came. People were like, you made me evacuate last year. That was a big pain. It was worthless. I don't want to evacuate this year. Obviously, Sandy was a very different storm. Um, so, you know, trying to keep that muscle memory, keep it going. You know, one thing, too, I would say is um, 
you know, New York City, like many cities, is a very crowded city. Um, you know, we're always uh, not emergency management per se, but we need to find housing. We need to find safe places for people to live. We have many ple people living below grade, living in, in basements, and um, almost all of the people that perished during Hurricane Ida, uh, the, the brunt of that storm happened late at night, early in the morning. Um, you know, they were in basement apartments and, and they didn't get the message. They couldn't get out. So we've been, and, and a lot of that group are very vulnerable socioeconomically, uh, linguistically, culturally, you know, they may not be tied into our, our regular channels. Um, so we've been working very hard to, um, you know, increase our messaging, increase our communication with, with different group, with people in basement apartments. Um, we have started an, a basement alert through Notify NYC, which is our main emergency notification system. Um, and this group uh, gets phone calls all the time. You know, as technology has evolved, people have moved away from landlines, from phone calls, people get text messages, people read things on Twitter or, um, you know, WhatsApp or something, but you know, that Twitter is not gonna wake people up in the middle of the night. So we've gone back to phone messages to consciously, you know, disrupting people's sleep so we could let them know in multiple languages at specific zip codes um, that, you know, you have to move to higher ground. This is a life safety. So those are a few of the things that we are working on. Um, and we're always looking for more, you know, to try new things, see what works, see how we can, um, because message fatigue is a real, is a real issue as well. Um, like I said, with Hurricane Irene, but, you know, we don't want to people to turn off even wireless emergency alerts, which are a fantastic tool if they're used correctly, you can swipe on your iPhone now. It used to be a whole process to uh, get off of WIAs. Now you can swipe on your iPhone and, and no more WIAs, which is in our eyes, uh, really a shame. So, so those are some of the things that we're balancing and we're working on. Last, do you wanna add? Yeah, I, Christina was pretty much focusing how uh, it affects communities. I want to highlight also how important it is how uh, these storms affect our infrastructure. And uh, for instance, the transportation system, largely the subway system operated by the MTA, but also bridges and tunnels, and uh, other, the uh, Port Authority of New York and New Jersey that also has uh, operating certain uh, like path trains and so on. Now, during Sandy, Practically all of those were flooded, okay? Uh, even so, something remarkable had uh, happened. We had published a year before Sandy an, uh, a report uh, sponsored by NYSERDA, a state agency, uh, that laid out what would happen to a typically 100-year storm uh, with its worst path uh, of the hurricane making landfall. And they had that information. And so they, when Sandy approached, they pulled this report out and sent their teams into the tunnels that we had outlined would flood, ripped out the signal control system that the <clears throat> salt water wouldn't get in and took them out the tunnels flooded pretty much like predicted. And then they pumped them out, which took a week, and brought those signal and control systems back. That shortened the downtime to one week from what we had forecast four to six weeks of the subway system. This smart operational move, given the right information that they had, saved the New York economy tens of billions of dollars of economic losses. Okay. Uh, because without a subway system, the economy wow. is only running at a fraction of its full volume. Uh, that's just an example of how proper use of information and science combined with smart decision makings at, in proper times can really save losses. And so the infrastructure has been upgraded 
up to an elevation of 18 feet above the datum um, for all the MTA subway entrances with federal funding after Sandy. But what they did not do, it was only in the low-lying coastal areas. It was in the high-lying areas that also can flood from heavy precipitation, like during Ida in 21. And so we still have the shutdown of our transportation system from heavy rainfalls will also increase in frequency and in intensity. So there is still a, another uh, demand on those uh, infrastructure operators to not just focus on the coastal front, but do a comprehensive approach with all the climate change impacts being considered. So I want to let folks in the audience know that there is a Q&A function in Zoom. You're welcome to put questions in into that uh, Q&A box, and we'll, we'll get to as many of those as we can at the end. I want to, you know, pull on a, a, a couple of things that, that we've been talking about in, in is we're approaching, you know, the, the way that the agencies, both federal and local engage communities have been changing. The, the way we communicate with people has been changing. Um, the resources at, at NYSEM have changed. You brought in the meteorologist. I'm curious, you know, is all of those are, are very fundamental to kind of preparedness and, and how we're how we're approaching things now is your agencies will start with Victoria on the federal side and then then Christina if you could provide the, the local or regional context is you're thinking about long-term planning within the agencies how is that being adjusted based on the changing intensity of hurricanes yeah and um I'll in my answer, I'll also address the question that's in the chat about um, relocation. So I think as we look at the long-term climate trends, um, we see both through sea level rise, the storm predictions, large swaths of our nation, coastal areas that are dealing with some really existential questions. And so in terms of long-term planning, um, our current stance as the federal government is that the question around relocation is hyper-local and needs to be community-driven. And so we have plenty of instances more and more each year of communities who are looking to do wholesale uh, relocation, whether it's in rural Alaska or South Louisiana, or, or we we've done buyout programs for many years as, as FEMA helping people move out of floodways. And so that's a trend that I think we'll continue to see increase, particularly as communities are presented with the information and what, about the climate projections and what they mean for where they live. Um, and, and, and that's certainly the more extreme adaptation measure is relocation of that scale. What we're also seeing is communities decide to protect in place. And yesterday, uh, I know I, I'm, I'm down in D back in DC, but yesterday I was in New York as part of Climate Week and I visited um, the New York Housing Authority's Clinton House in Harlem, where we've been investing through first the, our uh, pre-disaster mitigation program, and then they were a recent recipient of BRIC, and we've been investing in NYCHA's facilities for a while. I learned a couple interesting things, and it's always and I always love visiting uh, innovative projects that cities are doing. But here, there they it was another strong example of good long-term planning where they understand what uh, their facilities are likely to experience long-term. They mix that with um, very detailed kind of hydrological modeling down to understanding how their residents use their space down to like where the bike path is that isn't actually a bike path, but it's how people cut across the property to get from point A to point B. And so now they're doing what we see happening in many communities that are trying to protect in places better use their open space. And so what now is like a basketball court and a playground that's tattered and in disrepair is actually going to become water storage that's intended to hold thousands and thousands of gallons of water 
and to provide new recreational space for its residents. And so those are the type of multi-benefit solutions we see communities that are looking to live with water, be more absorptive, uh, be that sponge. The city, we hear a lot about cities becoming sponges. And so that's another end of the long-term adaptation strategy is if you're gonna protect in place, how do we do that in a way that involves nature that is increasing the sponginess of our cities? And if in the, and then if that's not an option, we're supporting folks in, in that process of considering larger scale relocation. So we're seeing the whole gamut take place and our programs are intentionally flexible so that a community driven process and approach that truly meets people's needs is what's driving the solutions that we're investing in. Christina, how about the, the local perspective? Yeah, although uh, Victoria did a pretty good job talking about. <laughs> I, I love, I was very inspired, Christina, by the work that you all are doing in New York. <laughs> <laughs> You're always welcome. Everyone's always welcome to come visit what we're working on. Uh, so, uh, you know, a, a few things that are a little more, a little less um, specific than that, but but looking at, uh, at our whole of government. Um, you know, one thing is we developed one NYC 2050, uh, which established a long-term citywide strategy um, to make forward thinking investments and core physical infrastructure and, and hazard mitigation. Um, the city has also created climate resiliency design guidelines um, that are being applied in a five-year pilot program across 23 city agencies um, to inform design and construction of city assets based on exposure to current and future coastal flood risk. Um, we've established Flood Help New York to connect eligible low and middle income homeowners with engineers to reduce their flood risk and flood insurance rates. Um, and you know, over the last few years, flood insurance enrollment has increased 59% among New Yorkers in the floodplain. Um, our friends at De Department of Environmental Protection, uh, they have formed a new Coastal Resiliency Bureau um, which was outlined in the city's plan, NYC 2023 plan, um, which is a, a central coordination point for flood resilience programs. Um, and so it's really, you know, like I said, being at emergency management for a long time, you know, one fundamental change with Sandy um, and then looking at Ida is people, their emergency management was really housed in uh, here in emergency management. And then there would be someone who had six other jobs right? And they would also be the emergency manager, or they would be the continuity of operations planner, or, you know, it would be in addition to security, it would be in addition to facilities, in addition to external affairs, there's all different models um, in the city. And, you know, we have seen that it has to start um, early on that, you know, we have to, as we're building, like I said, it takes a really long time to build things um, in the city. But the kind of uh, project that Victoria referenced or other things, you know, we we want those to to come organically as we're looking at um, at all these increasing hazards. And so, um, you know, and one great thing with our emergency management agency is as people move on, many times they'll move on. They can become the emergency manager at NYCHA. They can become the emergency manager um, at DEP or something. So they bring the principles, they bring what they've learned here, but then the expertise to that agency. Uh, because even though 270 people at emergency management here where I am sounds like a lot of people, if you think about 300,000 people, if you think about the scope of the city, you know, we're one um, small, small piece. And as has been referenced, we're kind of bouncing from emergency to emergency. One of the last big storms we had um, was, uh, December 23rd, 2022. So, you know, outside of hurricane season, but dealing with the tides, dealing, it wasn't a sunny day, there was rain, um, but the rain, you know, just kind of exacerbated the, the coastal, the tidal flooding that was happening. So um, we are looking at it in a, a larger view and, um, you know, incredibly it's 12 years since Sandy, um, you know, in another 12 years, we don't wanna be talking about the baby steps. We wanna be talking about a larger, infrastructure project. Yeah, in Northeastern, uh, in, the, in the winter time or post uh, hurricane season time, many of the coastal flooding events do occur actually in the winter months, uh, so-called Nor'easter storms here. And uh, they are causing quite a bit of impact here 
in that metropolitan area uh, and along other cities along the northeastern Atlantic coast. Uh, there are other questions that uh, I'm not sure either should jump forward into it, where someone asked, uh, are there other natural disasters uh, besides increased hurricanes? We already discussed uh, the more severe rainfalls, but what we should not forget, particularly from a health point of view, are heat waves. Uh, most fatalities from extreme weather events are not during flooding, they are during heat. And that is also where the socioeconomic factors come in because the poor folks can't, if they have air conditioning, can't even afford to pay all that money to run those air conditioners. So there is a real need and the city and Christine, I'm sure can comment on that has undertaken programs where we have cooling centers and so on. Uh, yeah, I'll just leave it with that at the moment. There are other things that I can add, but uh, probably Christina should add them here. Yeah, I would, um, you know, I would say it's a little cooler in the city now, but this um, summer, what you know we activate our cooling centers it seemed like every week um i think it was the most that definitely the earliest um but you know we were busy through june um and some of our locations weren't even available yet because they're based on it being the summer um you know and things but but it's also looking and, and we did a lot of work with working with the c40 um and other groups because um you know cooling centers are, are one but it really um, like you talked about air conditioning, but it, it also needs to be more, um, you know, looking at cool spaces when people, a more um, holistic approach and not just, um, you know, are people going to a library for a couple hours? Um, you know, so we are looking at that. We've been working um, with FEMA. I know that they've started to um, recognize heat in, in some of the hazard mitigation and other funding, which is um, been fantastic. And, you know, for us, just it, it's a little bit um, like what's happened with coastal storms that, um, you know, it's always gotten hot in the city, but we didn't have the type of heat. We still don't obviously have the type of heat that maybe in the Southwest or in the South, but it is getting much hotter. Um, you know, everybody knows that we had the air quality, um, you know, event last uh, June of 2023 that that much of, of the U.S. saw based on the um, Canada wildfires. And so, um, you know, we had an earthquake in April. Um, so not things that are unheard of, but just the way that um, they're happening and, you know, kind of trying to, uh, it used to be more, you know, high impact, low probability. Um, you know, now as things are, are coming more, um, we don't, we, what we don't want to do is paralyze people, right? And we don't want to say, okay, well, we can't focus on all of these things. So I'm, I'm just going to, shut down. Um, you know, people still hear um, the uh, the United General Assembly is going on right now um, outside of the traffic, which is off the hook. Um, you know, it just it brings back, um, you know, we just had the 23rd anniversary of 9-11. So, I mean, that is really ingrained in in the city's culture and, and something that people still think about really. It changed the whole country and world, but it really changed New York City. And so looking at all these different pieces, how do we manage? How do we look at an all hazards approach? Um, and a lot of it comes to vulnerable populations. Um, and so how, you know, working um, with family, with neighbors, we have a huge amount of renters here. Um, we have a lot of people that don't speak English um, that are maybe so socially isolated. Okay. So there, there's a lot of work to be done. There's a lot of challenges. Um, so that's I think I, I, I want to. <laughs> Probably I, not I wanna... now. I, I want to go into that a little bit more and 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 maybe we'll start with with Matthew and and then jump to Victoria and Christina. But you know, knowing that this is you know a crisis that cannot happen in a silo, and knowing that we need not only the government agencies working together to reach 
communities and, and, and households, but we also need collaboration with the private sector, um, the nonprofit community. So how are how is collaboration happening between agencies, private sector, and other public sector to, to really both manage hurricane responses, but also think about uh, the, the, the longer or the, the, the preparedness um, questions that you've all brought up? Um, so yes, to me, um, there's, there's a few things that we do. Um, so when we're trying to engage with the, the public, we have our warning coordination meteorologists that are in every <clears throat> community across the country, talking to the emergency managers, talking to the local nonprofits, um, talking to working with the private sector, you know, the entities that are there, um, both in their, you know, the kind of non-governmental agencies that want it, that can respond, um, but also just working with you know, anybody that might need the information from the weather service um, to then have a better response plan for their company uh, you know, or their the large warehouse, right? Do they probably have different responses than a business that is on the second story of, uh, of a 30-story of building? Um, you have different things you need to do and different kinds of information. Um, so just getting them that kind of information. Um, we are working on NOAA just signed a memorandum of, of understanding or agreement um, with the reinsurance uh, sector to kind of get them more information. So the reinsurance sector can then properly account for this increased probability, right? So we just talked about, um, you know, high, high risk, but low probability. But if we start to increase the probability of those high risk events, right? How do you account for that increase in probability of those high risk events? Um, and then a category five event coming in a hurricane coming in somewhere it's going to have longer impacts that can trail into a secondary event rather than a tropical storm. So now if you have that higher probability, you have to really take that into accounting there. Um, and then we're really trying to integrate a lot of that feedback into our products. Um, just at the, the organization that oversees the hurricane center, there is a social scientist on staff that is really responsible for helping us um, take all that feedback and how do we design our products and what calculations do we need to do to answer the questions that all these groups can ask? Victoria or Christina, either of you wanna wanna add to that? We're happy to, to jump in. Um, so there's to, to your question about kind of coordination and collaboration, I think what we're seeing is um, there, there are certainly a number of forums, which at the federal level we we use to collaborate, whether it's uh, interagency groups or at the regional level, specific um, regional agencies working closer together. I think some of the um, things I wanted to highlight and also address some of the questions in the chat, um, we, and this is an example of interagency coordination. So we have a community driven relocation task force that uh, has multiple agencies. I co-lead it with Department of Interior, um, but the bill, bipartisan infrastructure law gave money to USDA, DOI, a whole number of different agencies to help communities who want to relocate to do so. Some of the changes that we've had in our own programs to make things easier for folks with buyouts is I mentioned our flood mitigation assistance program. Part of that is also in a program called Swift Current, where we're trying to get dollars to communities faster who've experienced flooding events. And so in the recent years alone, like we had, uh, and I know this may not sound fast to most of you, but it is faster, I assure you, that we had, for instance, in Vermont and in FEMA Region 1, in, in less than five months, $4.5 million go out the door so that people could make more informed decisions about whether they wanted to rebuild in place once they knew how much their insurance uh, was going to be paying out. Um, or if they needed to relocate or needed a buyout. And so that's been part of the problem is this misalignment between the decisions we need to make post-disaster that keep us safe in the long term and when the resources come in. And so that's part of uh, some of the fragmentation and, and misalignment of, of when resources flow that we've been trying to address through um, speedier deployment of dollars like through SWIFT Current. 
Um, and we're also looking, there's been a lot of work during this administration to make sure that the drivers of climate change are also addressed. So at FEMA, we didn't get a lot of money through the Inflation Reduction Act, but we got some new authorities to do net zero projects, use low carbon, uh, low embodied carbon in, uh, in, in the, the work that's done. And uh, next week, we'll be having some really important announcements around increased federal cost share when there's more hazard mitigation in a project. And so again, that's a trend you see along all the um, among all the federal programs with the focus that we've had and um and, and so i think that'll help address both kind of the 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 reducing carbon and greenhouse gas emissions as part of investing in resilience um because they're two sides of, of one coin um and then the last thing i would say is simply this that um we have seen and again Christina, I'm a big, uh, having been a local official as a chief resilience officer, I'm always, I love the, the, I love what's always happening at the state and local level. No matter who's in the White House, the innovation will continue at the state and local level because it has to, because that's where people are uh, really connected to community needs, the vul different types of vulnerability, how the impact of different risks play out the inter interconnected consequences. And so at the federal level, I feel so fortunate to be part of creating an enabling environment to, to make that all go faster and hopefully better. But at the end of the day, it's our local leaders, our community activists. It's it's that ecosystem of people tackling the toughest issues that no matter who, which administration we have, keep fighting the fight because you have to. And so um, I think that's going to continue because there is no other choice. And then at the federal level, our, our job is to make it easier and hopefully uh, deploy more resources and and not have this be the high watermark. Like there's a lot of resources flowing but when you look at what Matthew's data says, what the what what the forecasts are, if the Inflation Reduction Act and the bipartisan infrastructure law are high watermark in this nation for investing in adaptation and resilience, 2050, 2080, they're not going to look good. And so it really needs to be a springboard. And we need to not only work together, continue to really optimize how we do that across sectors, but we have to be very cognizant that this needs to be a springboard and not the high watermark. Um, I have to apologize. Our executive director of exercises, uh, today is her retirement day. They've been holding her walkout <laughs> for me to do this panel, but we can't keep them at bay anymore. So um, I just, I'm going to drop off a couple of minutes early and um, thank the Waterfront Alliance for pulling us together. Um, and uh, yeah, we'll keep the good work going. Thank you. Thank, thank you for being here, Christina. Um, there's one last question from the audience. Um, and, and, we, and we've only got, got two minutes left. Uh, but you know, there's there's a couple questions in there about new development on coastlines, given the the additional flood risks that um, have been brought up, and kind of the intersection of that with the idea that there's resources out there for retreat. So, Victoria, can you kind of talk about the interplay of retreat versus new development, and how you know how they kind of overlap in, in, in some of the different resources that are out there? Uh, I can speak to a little bit, but essentially in the United States, it does come down largely to local land use decisions. And so uh, I know um, Christina had to, to, to jump, but um, we at FEMA, we, we do help regulate the floodplain, but that's where our kind of responsibility and that's in that jurisdiction stops. And then Noah, I don't, I know you guys do coastal zone management, but there's not, but again, it goes back to um, local governments having the primary responsibility for, for land use management. All right. Well, as one last piece, just from each of you, one quick final thought uh, that you want people to take away from this webinar, we'll go in the order you're showing up on my screen, which would be Klaus, Matthew, and then Victoria. Some progress has been made in adaptation, but it's breadcrumbs compared to what's needed. And I'm very concerned if we don't combine it with a rapid energy transformation from fossil to non-fossil, we need so much more to adapt in the future that both adaptation and mitigation are urgently in parallel needed 
that costs nationwide trillions of dollars. And so far, we've spent only billions of dollars. Matthew? Yes, that the storms are, and bigger storms are coming, um, and that it, we really need people, if you prepare at an individual level, you can help that community preparedness. Um, but really take into account that actions you take now and in the future might look a little different, um, but be ready, but be every year ready to be able to engage on taking those preparedness actions. Great, and Victoria? All right, since this is the last panel that I'm part of is for Climate Week, I'll take I'll take us home. I am leaving Climate Week feeling uh, encouraged that we're seeing different sectors and partners really trying to show up and figure out how to work together. And so I think to class's point, so much more is needed, but the the raw material is there and the willingness is there. It comes down to really uh, weaving our efforts together in a way that makes the most sense for the communities um, that are going to be most uh, disproportionately impacted by all of this. So I'm leaving encouraged after a very um, fruitful and informative climate week. As as am I, Victoria. As am I. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. Thank you to Victoria, Matthew, Klaus, um, and Christina. Uh, so thrilled to have you guys join us. Have a great day, everybody. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.